Hey, awesome. Come on, can you make some noise for Pastor Tim and Robin? Aren't they phenomenal? Great, great, great people. Hey, go ahead and have a seat. What I want to do is uh, I have a couple of things I want to share. Uh, one, uh, you know, whenever I get the opportunity to be able to preach, I love to just hear what God wants to say. And I felt like I had two prophetic nuggets for you guys, like drive through at McDonald's. You get that extra nugget. You know what I'm saying? You ordered a 20 piece and God bless you with a 21 piece. And they didn't charge you for the sauce. I like that. I like that. Uh, the first thing that I felt like the Lord wanted me to say to TFHSF is I am here. And it wasn't me like I am here. I really felt like the Lord was saying that he is here um, and that I am is here. You see, there's two instances when God uses that, that terminology to describe himself. I am when Moses is about to see deliverance encounter his people. And the second time is when they question the validity, the audacity, the authority of Jesus. And they said, Jesus, you're 30 something. How do you know Abraham? And Jesus says, I am. And what he was saying is this, the totality of God is available in one moment to work out his purposes. And I felt like this is a season for you as a church and as your leadership, the totality of all that God has is available for you to do what he's called you to do. Uh, and that's, that requires two, it requires action. There's things that God has put in your heart that sometimes you postpone because you don't believe it's available right now. And I feel like the Lord is just say, it's available right now. Uh, I saw this during worship that there's development that's happening in this area that's beyond what you anticipated. And so by holding on to something, property and land and other vehicles and things that God will give TFH San Francisco, God will begin to reveal that right now because of the development that he's doing for the future. TFH SF is a portal. You have to understand when King Josiah, when he became king, that was the same day and age that Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and a bad Negro grew up. <laughs> but because of what Josiah instituted, how he created a portal from heaven to earth, it raised up a new culture that was able to withstand the culture that would once take over. <laughs> so you guys are in, 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 in a good wake. It's more than momentum. This is a very spiritual and significant moment for you guys as a church. And so Tim and Robin, be, be encouraged, be strong, be courageous, take the land, be the Joshua, be the Caleb, give your, get your mountain, get your mountain, get your mountain. I'll share some other stuff later, but let's jump into the word. Uh, I want to continue in the series that you guys have been in and uh, kingdom you guys have been talking about, which was actually one of my favorite things. I love the kingdom. Like I used to, that used to be my like personal mission statement, like to be a man of the kingdom of God. Maybe I watch too much Lord of the Rings, play too many RPGs. I'm always trying to bump up my character, the dexterity, all of that. I'm trying to get those little points up. You know what I'm saying? You, know, you got to have the HP. You got to have that magic pot. All my geeks in here are like, yeah, I was geeky black before it was cool. So I just want to put that out there. When I was watching anime and trying to skateboard, uh, it wasn't cool back then. <laughs> nah, it's cool. Lil Wayne geeky, like, it's like, what? what? Sorry, I got really distracted. Okay. You're a good group to preach at. All right. So we're talking about the kingdom, and uh, I want to give you uh, the title of today's message. It's two things. It's either kingdom clarity, you can write that down, or becoming kingdom. What does it look like to become kingdom? And when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about your citizenship in God's, his plan, his purposes, it's your citizenship in heaven and that you are now an ambassador on the earth. So you don't represent the Philippines. Yeah, amen. I, I love my Filipino people. Come on now. <laughs> Too big panda saw. That's all I needed to know. You don't represent your LinkedIn account. You don't represent your credentials. There's something that supersedes that your blackness doesn't go beyond the kingdom of God. I saw a few of y'all in here. Okay. The kingdom of God goes before you and you represent God, who Jesus is to an earth that's far away from him. So we talked about the kingdom. It's not just adapting certain culture. It's becoming a kind of person. It's an identity issue. 
And so what I want to discuss with you is how do you become kingdom? How do you see your kids become kingdom kids? How do you leverage because you're a neuroscientist and leverage that for the kingdom of God? How do you use all that God has gifted you and called you to do for his purposes? And how can you get clear on that? How do you find clarity? Romans chapter 12 is probably one of my favorite portions of scripture uh, because the apostle Paul is dealing with a group of people who look much like us. These people didn't really know God, far away from God. And Paul begins to culminate the first 11 chapters to this one, I would call it apex of scripture. Romans 12, one, it reads this. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. That means if you're driving through life and you look through your rearview mirror, you would be able to see all of the things that God brought you out of. That mercy follows you and goes before you. Get that proverbial picture in your mind. You drive in, there's chaos, there's craziness, homeless, you see all of that. But behind you, you've seen and you've walked through the mercies of God. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Can we say that together? True and proper worship. Let's say that again. True and proper worship. Look at your neighbor and say, true, proper worship. True, I forget, what song was that? True, I I don't even know what that song was. Verse two is the kicker. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That was a transformation. The transformers. I am optimist. Yeah. All right. <laughs> By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Kingdom clarity. Becoming kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we ask, Lord, that your word would give us life. It would help us. It would give us the ability to discern what is appropriate for citizens of heaven. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to distinguish the decisions in which we need to make, the people in which we want to marry, the jobs in which we want to take, the locations we desire to relocate to. We come to the center of who you are, God. We ask, renew our minds. Teach us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as a parent, one of my favorite things to do as a parent is to trick my kids. I almost feel like that's the reason why I had kids. Just like trick them, you know what I'm saying? And uh, my, my kids have gotten good because sometimes I'll just say stuff like, yeah, go ahead and do that. And they're like, daddy, no. I'm like, go ahead, eat that. No, you're joking with me, right? Like, because they've been familiar with me, they've learned to distinguish when I'm saying something that's appropriate and when I'm not. They just, because of maybe osmosis or what I've taught them, and sometimes I just still go out of my way to kind of trick them. Like, I love scaring my kids. It's literally like the pastime of my house, like just to run up in their room and they're like, "Ah, ah, ah," and they're like, oh God, and they like fall on the ground, roaches on their back, like little turtles can't move. They just, ah. It's like my favorite thing, I giggle. My youngest hates it, she's a thug. So she literally, if you scare her, she just becomes into a, like an emotional just wreck. I'm probably traumatizing her and she may need counseling because I'm like, ha! Ah! It's like, I didn't, I didn't mean to, but I did mean to. Why are you scared? You know when you like really hurt somebody when they're like, why are you doing that? And their words get really long. And it's like, that was a really quick sentence, but that was a paragraph the way that you elongated all of those words. But I realized it's something that my dad used to do to me. And, and my dad did it through food, clearly. So uh, my, my dad would do that all the time. Like my dad was the type of person, like he would literally like create weird concoctions. He's from the South. That's all we'll say. And so he would create these weird concoctions. I remember one time we were literally eating cabbage and we noticed there were some things that, that looked like fingers in there. And we're like, dad, what is that? He was like, just eat it. I'm like, no, it looked like people's fingers in there. And after we interrogated this man, he was like, that's pigtails. So they literally took the little, my girl's laughing. She's like, God, oh my God. (laughs) Them pigtails will get you. He tried to sabotage us with pigtails. It took me 20 something years to realize pig's feet was legitimate pig's feet. Like I thought it was something else. I thought that was just the name of it. (laughs) No, you're gnawing on a pig's foot. foot. The same people that wouldn't eat that thing. You, anyway, moving on. I, I remember one time my dad gave us tea. 
we're like five, six years old. What is little black kids drinking tea? You know what I'm saying? Like, what are we doing tea? He's like, hey, have some tea. <laughs> I don't know why he turned to Fat Albert. He was very skinny, but for some reason he was Fat Albert in that moment. Hey, have some tea. <laughs> so he gives us some tea and uh, because I'm clearly, you know, weird. I broke the tea bag. My little brother, he drank it. Mm, ha ha, he loves it. And we go to the store and my little brother starts like holding his stomach and he's like, dad, what was in that tea? And he looks in the rearview mirror and says, it was laxative. <laughs> and we're like, what kind of parent are you? <laughs> hurt people, hurt people, I guess, right? <laughs> hurt people, hurt people. So over the years, I've learned to be a person that can delineate, to discern when something is acceptable. I don't accept everyone's food, right? You heard people say that, like, you don't just eat everybody's food. Like, you don't, you don't know what they put. They got cats? I ain't touching them hot dogs. You're like, no, I'm not eating it. But my, my palate has been tested for long enough that I'm able to distinguish when something is good or bad. So just because it looks good, it may not have the ingredients necessary to be beneficial for me. If we can only take this same concept and superimpose it to our spirituality, I wonder if there's some merit to it. That just because something looks delicious and could be even a delicacy of the culture that you come from may not be beneficial for you. But what Paul is saying is this, because you have been absorbed into the kingdom of God, which was once acceptable for you is now inappropriate. And for you to... <laughs> digest that, to intake that, to, to bring that into your body, to absorb that would actually be in conflict of your citizenship. So he says, in light of God's mercy, trust him, surrender to this new culture that wants to get on the inside of you. You see, an attribute that you acquire by becoming a child of the kingdom by discovering kingdom clarity is the ability to distinguish that which is good and evil. Your mind becomes restored and you can see things and you can see beyond the surface that something embedded at the core of that theology, that philosophy, that universe of madness, whatever, something is going on that is deeper than meets the eye. No pun intended. That was Transformers again, more than meets the eye. My ADD is at a thousand percent today. But he says, you're no longer a part of that kingdom, you're a part of this kingdom. You see, Paul writes these words to a community that is new to their faith. They're immature in their ability to distinguish between the old nature and embracing a new nature, a new culture that exemplifies Jesus. They were brought out of bondage. You have to understand about the Roman citizenship. There was literally fountains dedicated to genitalia. There was pornography that was all over. It was acceptable. There would be orgies and all kinds of wild stuff. They would literally have moments of gluttony where they would just eat, throw up, and eat again. So they were so sensual and hedonistic. And so Paul writes to this group of people that found Jesus in the midst of a culture that was so perverse, so opposite of God, that he says, hey, resist the tide that you were born in, but realize that God wants to transform you. And it's not just through religion, it's the re renewing of your mind. He says your identity has to change. And if you're going to find kingdom clarity, and guess what? You need kingdom clarity. You need kingdom clarity for your business. You need kingdom clarity for what college you're going to go to. You need kingdom clarity for the guy that you're living with. You kind of like him, but he can never get a job. You need clarity. You need to be able to distinguish, is this God or is this me? Is this God or is this the world? 
Is this God or is this the trauma that I experienced when I was 12 years old and that one person took advantage with me and I never told, but I walk with unforgiveness. So every time I get into a relationship, it's hard for me to distinguish. Does this person want to do me harm or is this person sent by God? So I just continue to break up the relationship and I keep, keep continue to go through this repetitive pattern. It's called a stronghold because your mind has not been renewed, but you have to become kingdom. And Paul says, you no longer live that way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. See, kingdom clarity comes by renewing our mind, realigning our actions and our thoughts to God's truth. That was so simple, it was still good. It was top ramen. <laughs> Kingdom clarity comes by renewing our mind, by realigning our actions and our thoughts to God's truth. We get kingdom clarity. We become kingdom kids when we renew our way of thinking about our bodies. We get clarity when we renew the way we think about our bodies. Oh, we're in a debate about our bodies right now, right? Oh, it goes across. It's all in and out. Do you do this? Are you free to do that? Do we do this? What's life? What's not life? But he says, hey, man, you belong to the kingdom. What you do with your bodies is not just your prerogative. You can't Bobby Brown this issue. What do you do with your bodies? My body belongs to me. It's my body. It's my body. I do it. It's my body. It's my body. My body. My body is telling me this. <laughs> but when Paul says this, he says, but you're a part of the kingdom. The least you can do, the most reasonable thing that you can do to honor God is to give him your bodies. And it's interesting that we deal with more issues about our bodies because maybe we don't understand what it really means to worship legitimately. He says this. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper, this is your true way of worship. In view of God's mercy and grace, all that God has done for me, I am now a living sacrifice. That means I am deserving of death, but because he parted the waters, if you will, because he stretched out his arms, he took the place for me on that cross. I am now a son of the most high God. And so in view of his mercies, it's not difficult to surrender because I'm literally dealing with issues of accounting and like, like with money. And I'm like, yo, if you gave me a million dollars, you can take, I don't know, fill in the blank. My Jordans, my shoes, my car. In light of all that you've done for me, the least I can do is give you this. And then you realize I'm deserving of death. The living sacrifice was an animal that was dedicated to atone for the sins of a nation or for what you've done. And so they were living on borrowed time. And so Paul says, you're living on borrowed time, but the least you can do is give your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. That means I am set apart for a purpose. That means God has intentionality for me, that I'm not just a body. I'm not just flesh and blood. There's something else consecrated, sanctified, if you will. That means my body belongs to God. And you have to change the way that you think because the many, there's so many of us, the way that we've gotten our way, the way that we've gotten out of situations is because we misinterpret the purpose of our bodies. Because we misinterpret how grace truly works. So you have to understand there's a call of God on your life. And so you are set apart. And God says in his word that there is an appropriate way to worship him when it comes to our bodies. Our bodies belong to God. And he says this, he says, there's, this is your true and proper way to worship. And if there is a true and proper way to worship, then that means there's an improper and an illegitimate way to worship. 
You see, true worship is this. True kingdom clarity is surrender and sacrifice. It's God, you have it all because you gave all to me. Therefore, I surrender my life to you. Lord, I'm not gonna hesitate all that belongs to you. My body belongs to you. It don't belong to them. Though they text me at three o'clock in the morning. This don't belong to them. This belongs to you. So therefore, I'm willing to serve, to sacrifice anything you would call on me to do, I'm willing to do. That is your proper true way of worship. Then that means there's an illegitimate and an improper way of worship. Well, let's just reverse engineer those statements. And that means selfishness and fighting is inappropriate for kingdom people. That means, no, God, this is mine. It belongs to me. And you fight against God. Sometimes we spend more time fighting against God than we do the devil. And we wonder why chaos and anxiety runs rampant in the streets of our schools and our city because we're fighting against God and we don't want to trust him just to surrender. Guess what? You will sacrifice no matter what. You just choose which God you're sacrificing to. Don't think they ain't a God of hustle. What you think Oakland is, is born on? From too short to too tall. It's all about hustling. <laughs> Just because there's some new people that want to come and gentrify the city doesn't mean that they haven't bowed their knee to the same God of hustle, call it startups. Don't gentrify your sin. It's still sin. You are living inappropriate when it comes to the things of God. And then you still live in chaos because you have dual citizenship. And God says, no, you must let go of all other citizenships, all other connections, all other ties. You now belong to the kingdom. And when you live in that duality, when you live in that compromise, guess what? Confusion comes in. That's why you can raise your hands one Sunday and twerk on Saturday. Shoot, then you come in on Sunday, you don't know what you're doing. So you twerking and worshiping, you just... You're like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> wrong dark room, wrong dark room, wrong dark room. <laughs> Surrender and sacrifice. Does your body belong to God? Do you hate your body? You hate the color of your skin? Do you hate where you come from? Do you hate that speech impediment? Do you hate that, that dysfunction? It belongs to God. And when you surrender, he takes all of you, not just the invisible, but the visible parts of you. You're not just being celibate, you're belonging and becoming because it belongs to him. So to use it in any other way would be inappropriate. The second thing that we see, and before I, I move on, I wanna read this quote because I brought Emmanuel with me and we were talking about this and he said this, I know this was very profound. He said, you'll settle when you don't believe you're set apart for a purpose. You'll compromise your body when you don't believe that you'll set apart for a purpose. Addiction becomes more prevalent when you don't realize that you're set apart for a purpose. So we see finding kingdom, kingdom clarity first, we surrender and submit our bodies to God. And Paul goes on and he says, you'll discover kingdom clarity through two things. Two things, the first thing is this, resistance. And the second thing is renewal. He says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what he's saying is this, resist the patterns of this world, resist. But then he says, renewing your mind will bring about transformation. You see, most believers just live in resistance training. I don't do that. I don't watch that. 
I don't drink that. Well, I do, but not too much because I'm a believer. That's resistance. And that is beneficial, but it does not lead to transformation. It's the equivalent of this. How many of you guys like working out? How many of you guys are, you know, you're in the gym. My little man in the back, he's 12. He's like, yeah, I go right here. Just preparing for puberty. Got to get those pecs going. But how many of you guys go to the gym? Anybody familiar with resistance training? Now, resistance training is this. You get under that, that barbell. You get under those, you know, those weights. I don't even know what they're called. Clearly, I'm not resisting anything. I'm like, what are those? But when you're resistance and you're training, you're allowing your muscles to be broken down and to recover. But guess what? Resistance training alone does not produce transformation. You can go to the gym seven days a week and be lifting and curling and lifting and curling. And if you go home and DoorDash is at your door every time you order a meal and you're eating Twinkies and you're eating, you know, whatever you want to eat, guess what? You may get stronger, but you won't see transformation. That's why religion is so deadly because it creates an external ideology that you belong to God based on what you do. But guess what? There's a part of resistance training that is good. Sometimes you just need to resist. Sometimes the the Bible says, resist the devil and he shall flee. The Bible says that sin is crouching at the door, looking for who it may devour. And some of us, because we're like, grace, grace, there's no resistance. So sin comes and you on your ring app. You're like, sin, look at sin coming, looking all cute. Sin don't even get to knock on the door. You're like, come on in, sin. I've been waiting for you. Have a seat, sin. Sin, what you been doing, sin? We don't even need to talk, sin. Let's just get to write what we came here for. Because there's no resistance. You do need to say no. And somehow we've abdicated the authority that is in Jesus, that Jesus enables us to say no to some things, but we don't stop at the no. When he looked at the woman who was caught in adultery and he said, go and sin no more. It was not resistance training. It was renewing her mind because he was enabling her to get out of that shame and that brokenness because she used her body for inappropriate things. But God says, I am enabling you and I am renewing the way you think because I no longer judge you. Are there any accusers left? No, she says, go and sin no more. You need your mind to be renewed. You see, resistance is the discipline and God disciplines those he loves. God will even cause us to resist, but renewing our minds is the game changer. Renewing our mind moves us from resistance from just saying no into a place where we want to say yes. I'm gonna be honest, man. I've looked at some things, watched some things, and some things be like, hey, Jules, remember me? Like, no, Twink, I'm just joking. (laughs) It's a lot darker than that. But when my mind is renewed, it's not only enabling me to say no, it's creating a new desire to say yes. Isn't that that so much better? Because you just say no to some stuff. You just be like, no, no, no. But I want to say yes. You see, when God begins to reorganize our thoughts, and he begins to challenge the way that we're thinking, our minds become renewed. You see, when we minimize the renewing of of one's mind, we live in a spiritual vacuum. The moment that community is removed, the services are offline, we go back to our old selves. But when our minds are renewed, our desires begin to change. Resistance works in conjunction with God as we're renewing. This is when we incorporate God's practices and his spirit together. So how do we renew our minds? The first thing we have to understand is, and this is not on the screen, we resist the thoughts that are, or maybe it is on the screen. Yeah, it is on the screen. Good job, you guys. We resist the thoughts that are in conflict with God's truth. Hebrews 12 says, lay aside every weight and the sin which both so easily besets us and let us run. The areas of our lives that consistently lead us away from God. A besetting sin is that thing that we constantly struggle with. Just because you don't struggle with mean, doesn't mean that it's not a besetting sin for somebody else. 
guess what? There may be some things you will live with. And being tempted in those areas is not bad. It's actually an indicator that you belong to another kingdom. When you recognize the temptation and you resist the temptation, you're partnering with God and you're creating that structure and there's strength that's in that. That's why the Bible says, resist the devil and he shall flee. But it also says, run towards God. You see, we renew our thoughts through God's truth. Ephesians 5.26 says this, to make her clean, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. See, we have to take those spiritual practices and allow God to minister to ourselves at a personal level. You see, I wanna show you a little bit of what my mind looks like when I'm trying to work out the renewing process of God's truth. Many times in the morning, I'll wake up and I'll get in my devotions. How many guys like to read the Bible? Anybody like Bible, got a Bible reading plan? Okay, three of you, praise God for that. <laughs> but we see this all the time. Usually I'll wake up, Sometimes five o'clock, if my wife was here, she'd be like, bro, you lying, you ain't waking up that early. <laughs> but I wake up and I try to start the morning in God's word, renewing my mind. It's been a few moments and I read Old Testament, New Testament, a little bit of Proverbs and Psalms, get a smorgasbord of God's truth. Why? It's because I know the crazy, chaotic thoughts that I have. By the time that I get to the car, I'm feeling good about myself. I'm like, I'm more than a conqueror. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. You know, I got my podcast going. I got my Maverick City. I'm doing all that I can. And somehow, because of the insecurity that I have, I find myself tuning into the thoughts, that text message that I sent. And all I saw was bubbles and they didn't respond. And so now as I'm driving throughout life, that insecurity begins to kick in and that insecurity starts reaching for the wheel and takes over. So God's truth begins to go into the backseat. And I don't know if you're like me, but it starts off in insecurity with fear and anxiety. And I'm freaking out and I'm looking over my shoulder and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm distracted. I'm not paying attention. Every text message freaks me out. But if I'm not careful, I start tuning into the next thing. I don't know about you, but for me, I go from insecurity to aggression and aggression begins to take over. And this is where me as a leader, I'm like, hey, I got to lead. I got to show them that I'm in charge. They're not going to text me. I'm going to show him that I'm a real pastor. I lay hands on people. I lay hands. And by the time that I get home, after going from insecurity to aggression, apathy, begins to take over. So my kids come and be like, Daddy, you want to play? I'm like, no, I don't want to play. <laughs> Daddy, what did you do? Nothing. I just thought about everything today. Who's really working today? You know what I'm saying? With all the Zoom meetings, are you really working? You know. But then I start to overindulge. I start to entertain myself. And my mind goes through this cycle on repeat. I keep tuning into the different voices. Then the next day, God's truth comes back into my life. Then insecurity comes back into my life. Then aggression comes back into my life. And then apathy comes back into my life. But here's the thing. This is what happens when your mind remains unrenewed to the truth of God's position in his word in your life. See, when we renew our minds, apathy, can, can you scoot over? When God's truth is driving you, those insecurities may not ever leave, but they stay in their appropriate places. That aggression, when it comes to that entrepreneurial endeavor that you're about to take on, it's necessary, but it doesn't need to be the captain. Come on. It has to submit. Why? Because your bodies no longer belong to you. Your mind, your will, and emotions all submit to the new nature that Jesus is bringing into you. Let me just be real. Lust ain't never leaving me.
I don't even want it to leave. I want it to stay in its proper place. Because I want to look at my wife with desire, fresh passion. Like, girl, I know I've been with you for 10 years, but shoot, we could do 10 more. You know, sometimes my wife would be like, you see her over there? I'd be like, no. Why would you even, this trickery. One time my, my wife tried to get me to go to Hooters. I said, hell no, heaven yes. You ain't about to play me. <laughs> the wings are good. <laughs> you lying. They ain't that good. That's resistance. But when my mind is renewed, I don't just see the dysfunctions and the insecurities. I see the way that God made her. It creates fresh romance and passion. Maybe your minds have been bombarded by all the pornography and you've superimposed that into your marriage and it's quenched out that flame. Maybe because of that trauma, it stunted your ability to have confidence. And so every time you get into a relationship, he takes lead and you end up hurt. But when God begins to renew your mind, you see, it's not just reading the word. The University of Utah, they did this. They did a test. They put believers in an MRI and had them read the word or listen to, to Bible readings and scripture. And the, they, they literally discovered this, that through their minds, it started to reroute their focus and their ability for reward. It said their ideals and their moral decisions started to change because something supernaturally was taking place when God's word was permeating their thoughts. Isn't it amazing when the world catches up to Jesus? I'm like, it's archaic, it's old. They don't know what they're talking about. That Bible is just an old book, it's an old book. It's amazing that every movie out there is about a book. Renew your mind. Then it says this, then you'll be able to prove what is perfect and pleasing to God. Like a jeweler that picks up fine emeralds or diamonds and gold can inspect and realize that ain't real. Ain't no two carat gold, that ain't no real. That's not a real diamond. He says, then you will be able to distinguish how that, that relationship, that's actually a healthy relationship. But if you never allow your mind to be renewed, if you never surrender your bodies to God, you live a very selfish, you live a very closed in life to the things of God, you fight against God, you can come to church. But will Jesus go home with you? Is God driving your car? Do you have that clarity you're longing for? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask, Lord, that your grace and your goodness would give us fresh strength. Lord, I, I thank you for this church and what you're doing. And Lord, all throughout this room, there may be men and women that have occupied that driver's seat or that trauma has occupied that driver's seat of their life. And they're saying today, Jesus, take the wheel. This morning, there's two groups of people that I wanna pray for. The first one is this, you have not fully surrendered your life to God. You've been fighting against God. Maybe it's been a life of selfishness and you would say, hey, Pastor Jules, man, I need to surrender. I've been used for all the wrong things and I've been using others and using myself for all the wrong things and I'm in sin. I need to get right with God. Every eye closed, every head bowed. You say, hey, I'm far away from God. I need to get right with him. I'm not gonna have you do something crazy, but could you do me a huge favor? Could you just lift your hand and say, today, I do wanna surrender. Come on, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it, come on. Yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's pray right now. This is a great moment. Can you put your hand over your heart all across the room? Can you say this? Father, forgive me. I surrender. I give you my old life and I receive the new life. Free me from sin. I surrender. I repent. Wash me. Make me new. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's celebrate with those that have come to faith even in this moment.